Um, okay. uh, this is a presentation on hmm, a few things. <laughs> A little bit indirect, but um, it was originally prepared for some yoga group. <laughs> so, I previously talked about the fact that we're supposed to ask questions, and even scientists ask questions. Uh, so they're, that's good. Uh, they're looking for other life, or cause of life, or cause of everything exists and so they ever like that and so they send things up in the space and they sent up um, I think it's 1990s or so they sent up the Hubble telescope and they had their theories previously about everything but the Hubble telescope was such that it was outside the atmosphere of the earth so therefore it could get much clearer pictures because the earth atmosphere interferes with the clarity of your images and when we're down on therefore they go on top of mountains and have their observatories on mountains and things like that but even then you have the atmosphere interfering so when you get outside the earth's atmosphere you can get much clearer photographs that you can enlarge yeah? so this Hubble telescope was sent up into orbiting in space to take pictures and send back to earth so they did that and it was successful and they started the Hubble telescope began sending message, you know, photographs back to Earth and uh, the different parts of the sky and they focus on one section of the sky and, and take photographs and they would enlarge these photographs. So what happened was when they saw these photographs and they enlarged them then they were really shocked because what they thought were stars in the sky were not stars at all. They were galaxies. One little dot there in the sky was actually a huge galaxy that had millions of stars in it. <laughs> they didn't know it when they were down on Earth, but when they got outside the Earth atmosphere and they, uh, you know, put the telescope up there and put the camera up there, and they got very clear pictures and they could enlarge these pictures. So they found all sorts of fantastic images of what was up there. You know, they thought these were little stars, but actually they were huge galaxies and you know, all sorts of things in space, gas, gas explosions, etc., nebulae, etc. So uh, it was quite fantastic. And uh, then they realized from this that uh, the universe is <laughs> much bigger than we thought it was because you see these little dots up there is actually like a whole galaxy which has got millions of stars in it. Huh? So in this way, uh, their concept of how big the universe was and how many stars and how many planets were there uh, increased. They understood that they didn't know anything and it, this one simple act of getting the telescope outside the Earth had enlarged their vision of how big the universe actually was with all these different uh, things, uh, you know, uh, explosions and things in space. Uh, this is called the cat's eye. It looks like a cat's eye. Yeah. This looks like Varaha. <laughs> so all sorts of things they found up there. But the idea is that each of these th uh, galaxies is a whole group of, and if you, of course you can enlarge this again and see how many stars are in this, and each star is like a, a sun. And so many of those suns would have planets going around them, and some of them would also be favorable for life. So based on this information then they understood that it looks like, you know, it's most probable that there's life all over the universe. <laughs> Very far away, definitely, but it must be there because there's, there's so much possibility out there. There's so many stars and there's so many galaxies and there's so many planets out there. <laughs> so it's a vast area and you go light years between each galaxy and there's this blank space and whatever like that and then you get into each galaxy and you, and you see light years going from one star to the next within a galaxy so it's a huge amount of space with all these galaxies floating around and yeah, so uh, this way they, they enlarged their idea of what the universe was oh this is the cat sign I'd be like okay like this so anyway this is an actual picture from yeah, 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 they're from the uh, telescope. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and we're in one of these. We see the Milky Way. 
That's our galaxy. That's one galaxy among many, many galaxies. And then if you go beyond that, then you'll see little points in the sky which will look like stars, but they're actually galaxies also. And they're like a whole Milky Way with a whole you know, series of things in it. So we're within this one galaxy with so many stars in it, so many suns in it. And we're one little thing there, one little dot there. And we're struggling to get to the moon. <laughs> One little planet in our solar system. We can't get to the next star or anything like that. And we've got our little Earth planet here going around the sun, which is one of those. One of those little spots in this particular galaxy. So we can see how small and significant we are in the whole universe by that. So this is very shocking to the scientists. But then they understood that it looks like the, you know, the universe is uh, bigger than we thought it and there must be life in so many places out there because of that, just the possibility of life there, like Carl Sagan, he said, there, 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 there's so many possibilities out there, there must be life there. And life which is much more advanced than our life. We're not the only ones here. In fact, we're, you know, um, it could be life which is millions of years more advanced than us in all parts of the universe. So anyway, um, th that's their conclusion. Uh, at least they got some appreciation of the size of the universe and the possibility of life everywhere. At the same time, we know that in uh, India, uh, already we see in the Bhagavatam, that they already had a conception of the universe and they already knew that um, you know, it was uh, beyond our perception in one sense. We, we're just one little um, Varsha and we can't even get to the next Varsha, etc. We're on Jumbo Dweep and then we have all the other uh, Dweepas and islands and um, oceans, etc. around this and we've got Mount Meru. So they had a conception of the universe also, which is quite different in one sense from the modern concept, but at the same time, not so much different. Like here we have a concept here of a that's just one galaxy. <laughs> Here we have another thing that looks like a, a big whirling galaxy also. That's the whole of the Bhumandala with this central pivot of Mount Meru in it. Uh, this is actually a Buddhist one, but same thing in India also. And we have this, uh, you know, the yantras of India also representing this universe. Uh, so we have similar, in one sense, similarity. There is some sort of symmetry here, like we see a symmetry in the galaxy, and we see a symmetry here in the formation of the yantra, which is the universe, nice circles, squares, everything, lotus, etc. Uh, so there's some pattern uh, behind the universe. That's the idea of the yantra. Huh? Yeah, okay. And of course we have that lotus in the middle. <laughs> like that. So, uh, there's the Dweepas. <laughs> this is a Jain representation of the universe. So, the Buddhas, the Jains, and the Vedas all have the same idea of the universe. Like that. And it's not just two-dimensional. It goes up above, it goes below, like this. LS planets, heavenly planets, etc. And of course we see the Angkor Wat itself is based upon this. So this is the original TOVP. This is illustration of the universe, what it is. Yeah. So in the center we have Mount Meru, which is the central uh, temple tower there. And so there was a, a Vishnu there originally in that. Now they got a Buddha there, was originally a Vishnu there. And then we find the expanding rings around it. So it's like a yantra or like a, uh, a mandala, which represents the universe. Like that, and that, that's the Mount Meru in the middle there. Yeah. Uh, so in other words, the temple itself is representing the whole universe and the uh, symmetry and harmony within the universe as if it's planned out by somebody, which we find reflected in uh, plants and animals and pine cones and uh, flowers and yeah, the lotus, of course. Yeah. And in the uh, Western world, of course, also, they were looking for some sort of symmetry and everything. This is what, is this Da Vinci's? Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci's uh, idea that the human body was actually very uh, based on some laws of symmetry. <laughs> yeah. So he tried to figure that out. And of course we find the same in uh, Indian dance and Bharatanatyam. They take the body also as some sort of uh, very, uh, you could say, um, uh, proportion in a certain way. 
which allows it to move and uh, gracefully present stories, etc. Uh, but how did they um, get this concept of a universe with symmetry, etc., uh, in ancient times, which is coming out to be quite similar to the galaxies that we see in the whole concept of the universe in modern science. It wasn't by using telescopes, Hubble telescopes or anything. Uh, so actually it was because they realized it inside. They got a vision from inside or from a different source by which they were, to, were able to understand things, which is why present time, no matter how hard we study the Bhagavatam in the fifth canto, we can't really understand it because we don't have the inner vision to see it from another way. So, but if we were, then we would understand why it's like that, why it's explained in that way. So anyway, uh, the uh, people of India for a long time have been uh, seeking the truth inside, not by looking up at the sky and using telescopes or going to the moon or whatever. So that is what we mean by yoga. Uh, which presents a um, yoga, as I said, means to join together, to unite, to harmonize. So what is it harmonizing? So the universe, the body, the mind, and the soul, and ultimately God. It, it's trying to um, give a holistic view of all existence. That is what yoga is doing. However, we have many concepts of yoga and different people understand it differently. In the modern world particularly, it has become physical exercise. Uh, all the big gyms have a yoga class and everybody goes to the yoga class to <laughs> do some exercise and lose some weight. Uh, so that's one concept of yoga. Uh, it's not untrue, but or to get flexibility of the body and you know they give prizes for the one who can do the most flexible thing or you know the, the, the Iyengar's 25 star yoga pose or something if he does that then he gets first prize so, which requires a lot of contortion of the body uh, is it gymnastics or whatever uh, of course more serious people like yogis would do it to get um, cities or powers um, mystical powers like the ability to travel out of the body, uh, to control other people's minds, to produce objects, whatever like that. So that's uh, not in the modern world, but previously they did it for that, for cities. Huh? Is it just some austerity of the body to get liberation or whatever? So you know, if we go to the Kumbh Mela, we'll see many yogis standing up on one leg for 30 years with their hand in the air or something like that, just to do austerity. So. We have many ideas about what yoga is uh, and who's qualified for yoga. Uh, that's another thing nowadays. Everybody can do yoga. You just pay some money and go to the yoga studio. But uh, we should look to the, you know, dogs can also do yoga now. So we have doga for dogs <laughs> and for the cats also. But uh, we should actually try to find the authority on yoga. So in India, we have what are called the Sadarshanas, six philosophical systems which were quite popular in ancient India, based upon the Vedas, not necessarily the correct meaning of the Vedas, but were, they claim that we're you know, following the Vedas. And one of the Darshans is Yoga. And its uh, founder is Patanjali. Probably not the original founder, but at least he's the one that wrote the foundational work called the Yoga Sutras, upon which later works were based. And that uh, Yoga Sutra is still intact today, and there's many commentaries on it, and there's many translations of it into English as well. It's basically not so much the physical exercises, but more the, uh, you can say, almost the philosophical aspects of yoga. Anyway, Patanjali was the source of this. Uh, so what does he say about yoga? What is yoga? So in his system we have, it's called astanga yoga. Uh, anga means limb or part and asta means eight. So it's got eight parts to it. We have preliminary processes, yama and niyama. 
Yama means to restrain or control. So we got things that you have to stop doing. Stop the violence. Stop lying. Stop thieving. Stop sex life. Stop hoarding. You know, so these are some basic things. Mm, we can say you know, moral uh, rules of conduct that you have to follow before you can even begin yoga. Yeah? So in other words, you do have to read a, a, lead a very moral, truthful, austere life to start yoga. It requires a lot of sattva and a lot of sense control. Uh, niyama. Of course, it's got the word yama in it, so it's also some type of control. Uh, so these are not the things you stop, but the things you do. <laughs> the first one's the negative. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Nishad. Forbidden. The niyamas are things you do. So these are the um, things. Cleanliness. Satisfaction. Uh, which means we are satisfied within, not with sense stimulus. Austerity. Voluntary control of the senses. Hardship for the body. Study. Study the Vedas. Worship of God. So these are the second rung, or the second step. What you avoid, what you do. Then, this is the asanas, this is the part that everybody knows about around the world. Uh, the postures of yoga. Uh, there are many, many postures. And many different teachers have many different techniques for doing that. So we got many schools of yoga. Uh, ultimately, the uh, final goal is to do all of these postures so you can sit for meditation. <laughs> That's all it's for ultimately. So you can sit nicely for meditation. And the reason for that is that it's only through the meditation, if you sit properly, then it's going to work properly. Yeah. Uh, so, asanas is there. Within Patanjali's yoga system in his book, you know, he doesn't mention too many asanas. And most of them are simple ones like Padmasana or things like that, the sitting postures. It doesn't get into these more difficult or complex postures at all. Um, anyway, there are many. And um, then we have next step, Pranayama. This is another Yama, like the first Yama was control. So this is controlling the Prana, the breath. Uh, which means we regulate the breathing, breathing in and breathing out. So you count how, how many seconds in, how many seconds out, how many seconds holding, etc. Uh, so this regulates the breathing and it slows it down or regulates it at a certain level. So why is this? Because the yogis found that if you do this, uh, good for the health and Ultimately, it makes the mind very peaceful. Yeah. So it, it's a physical way of altering the body so that the heartbeat slows, so the body uh, doesn't get so excited, it calms down, the brain is more relaxed, etc. Simply, simple process of controlling the breathing. Uh, so this is uh, fourth stage, uh, Anga. Uh, so these are basically physical, yeah, on, on the bodily level. Then we have the uh, more mental level, huh? withdrawing the senses from external objects. We're trying to uh, give up the enjoyment attitude of our senses by withdrawing it from not looking at objects or tasting and seeing and hearing, etc. And then dharana, a concentration of the mind inwards. When this becomes more steady, we call it meditation. One is able to do it for some period of time. And then the final stage is samadhi, where all mental thoughts, impressions, concepts disappear, and all that is left is the atma, being conscious, without the interference of mind, false ego, etc., intelligence. So that's the final stage, that's the eighth stage. So, uh, the first ones were all to do with the body, and then the final, the, the three ones, Pratyahara, Dharana, Jhana, had to do with the mind, and then the final one was 
Atma. Hmm? So, in other words, that mind is very useful. Uh, it goes along with the body, but it's very mer uh, useful in order to get us out of the body and realize the soul. It's kind of a bridge between the soul and the body. The mind is an intermediary there, and by using it, we can understand that we're the soul, not the body. So this is the process of yoga according to Patanjali. His second sutra actually is this. Yoga, Chitta Vritti Niroda. Yoga means to stop the functions of the material consciousness. Stop all your thoughts completely. That is yoga. So it's not physical at all actually. It's the goal is something else. Huh? And we find his last sutra. Liberation is freedom from the material qualities and material goals. Liberation is establishment of the self in its spiritual nature. It's realization of Atma. That is what yoga is. Huh? So it's definitely beyond the material body even though they, people utilize it for physical things now. Okay. Now, so therefore, the yogis, um, who are more advanced, would use the yoga process in order to get liberation from birth and death in this world. Yeah. Not simply to get rid of fat on the body or get good health. Yeah. So, here we have the three bodies. That's the gross body. This is the subtle body. This is the atma. So we got these three levels of existence. And we don't reject any of these things. The yogi uses the physical body for doing the asanas and the pranayama, etc. Then he does a pratyahara, dharana and jhana using the subtle body. And through that he realizes the atma, the soul. Uh, so we cannot even, we cannot perceive the soul. The soul perceives itself. Unfortunately, the soul now is filtered through the ahankara. So our perception of the soul is, becomes perception of the I am the body. <laughs> so we don't see the soul, we see the body instead. We think of everything in terms of body because of ahankara. Mm. So we perceive the body, we can't even perceive the subtle body, that second stage, which is there. We don't even perceive this stage. It's there, but we don't know about it. However, we do see in uh, yoga and even Chinese medicine and other alternative medicines, they accept this other body. It's, uh, it's very complex. It's like this physical body with the veins and the arteries and the uh, skeleton, etc. But it's not, it's not physical at all, and grossly physical. We have the meridians in Chinese medicine, etc. And uh, the nadis and the... Uh, Ayurveda and uh, yoga, and they're, they're not visible things. Huh? Uh, so these have been accepted all along. And along with that we get the chakras in the body, the uh, subtle energy centers in the subtle body. Huh? We've got the Muladhar chakra, the Swadhisthan chakra, the Manipurak chakra, the Anatta chakra, the Vishuddha chakra, Agya chakra and the Sasrara chakra, all in a line which go from gross material existence all the way up until realization. So the, the chakras of our body also in order of our consciousness, from the lowest consciousness to the highest consciousness. So generally animals and uh, human beings and sudras will be at the basic chakra, the muladhar chakra level. Uh, other human beings will get up to the enjoying tendency and the money puruk chakra. You usually they get stopped here in the middle at money puruk chakra at the navel. They don't get much higher than that. Everybody gets stopped up there, uh, and then they don't get to the anahata and the uh, vishuddha, etc. So they're they're blocked. Everybody's blocked in the lower three uh, in terms of consciousness. Uh, so the goal of the yoga is actually like in uh, Kundalini yoga is to free the line of chakras and you can get the kundalini rising through the chakras up to the top of the head then you get your realization <clears throat> okay and here we have the chakra system which we cannot see with these eyes interestingly enough we have people that can see the chakras hmm? 
oh, here's the smart chakras. <laughs> uh, each chakra has a devata also, and it has a syllable to go with it, a bead syllable for the, uh, this is the earthly chakra, lum is the bead. Very, very basic. This is the second chakra, the water bead, bum. Physical pleasure. This is the navel chakra, rum. This is the fire bead, digest your food. <laughs> emotional, uh, and everybody gets stuck here usually, emotional. They get stuck in this chakra. Anahata, oh, this is the love chakra. Uh, air bead, yum. Throat chakra, ether. Vishuddha chakra, uh, for speaking and for responsibility. Then we have Agya Chakra. This is the third eye. The concepts uh, of the view of the world, etc. And top we get Sasrata Chakra, spiritual chakra. So we're, we're going from the grossest consciousness to the highest consciousness in the subtle body also. Now, as I said, some people can actually see the chakras. Uh, this is a diagram from a book by a American woman who was doing, she was actually in Nassau at one time, scientist, but she began to do therapeutic work, alternative therapies like massage, etc. And at a certain point she began to see chakras on people's bodies. And this is the diagram she drew. So her, in her system, the chakras are on both sides. It's not just chakra, chakra, chakras. Two chakras. <laughs> one on this side, one on this side. Going off on the back and the front of your body. And she could see those chakras. And the interesting thing is they, they were moving. They're not static. Like, of course, they're depicted as lotuses. Hmm? Lotus, 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 eh? little lotuses. But actually they are wheels, she says. They're, they're turning around like little wheels, which that's what a chakra is, a wheel. <laughs> spinning around like this. So all your chakras are spinning. But sometimes they're not spinning enough, or they're slowing down, or they're stopping. Or they're reversing, going backwards. <laughs> of course they're not, they're, they're all broken, you know, they're not, they're not functioning at all. Uh, so then she saw how the chakras, if they are malfunctioning, just like in a car, if, if the gears aren't working properly, then the car doesn't operate. So if one chakra is not operating properly, then that part of the body starts having illness. It's going too fast, going too slow, going backwards or whatever, then that part of the body gets the sickness. So in other words, the subtle body is related to the gross body and if you've got a bad subtle body then that's going to make a bad gross body. Which simply means that if you're all mentally stressed out or have a lot of emotional problems, you can have a lot of physical problems also. <laughs> that's what it means. Right? So some doctors do say that half of your diseases are in your mind. Huh? And no matter how much you cure the body, if your mind is not peaceful, you're going to get sick again. <laughs> so that was the uh, her conclusion. And then she found ways of curing the chakras, getting them right, going at the right speed, <laughs> in the right direction. And not only do we have chakras, but the chakras existed on different levels or different dimensions of the subtle body. The subtle body had many layers, like we have many bodies here, not just this body. We've got the next body, which is the pranic body, the next body. We've got an emotional body, we've got an intellectual body, we've got a karmic body, we've got a, a spiritual, we've got all these layers kind of, of bodies in us. So we're, we're not one person, we're like seven, eight, nine personalities stuck in there in a subtle level, all with chakras on them. So you can have a, a chakra imbalance on any particular level, one of the levels. So it's a very complex body, just like this physical body is, uh, but invisible to modern science, but nevertheless existing. Anyway, that's the yoga system, quite complex. Okay, um, so um, the subtle body we often can call the mind. It's not only you know, the karma is stuck in there, memory, past life experiences, so many things, intelligence, false ego, whatever. You can just call the whole thing mind, the whole thing is mind. And even in the um, 
material world, the mind has a very powerful function. And that's why the human being mind is more powerful than the animals and therefore the human being is considered superior to the animals because of the power of the mind, how he can use his mind. So it can be very useful, it can create a lot of things. Uh, human beings do many things that animals cannot do. We can create architecture, science, arts, literature, so many things. And animals can't do that. Uh, so very, very good. Of course, it's also the problem uh, of giving destruction as well. We use the mind for all sorts of uh, destructive things. Our intelligence, we can use it positively or we can use it negatively. That's the, um, let's say the misfortune of the human being. <laughs> he can do both things. <laughs> so, uh, very powerful. So we don't even realize how powerful the mind is. Of course, the yogis have understood that. But most people don't understand that. However, science also, on a certain level, is beginning to understand that the mind is very powerful. So, in the 1950s and 60s, there was the Cold War, which was a conflict between the military powers of Russia and America. And uh, they were both competing, uh, making new military weapons, all sorts of secret weapons, <laughs> military things, whether it be biological or chemical or whatever, atomic weapons, nuclear weapons, all these things. Uh, you know, all sorts of things they were doing to compete with each other. At a certain point, the Americans got wind through their spies or whatever that the Soviet Russia was experimenting with psychics <laughs> because there were many very powerful psychics in Russia. Huh? They could move objects across the table with their mind, etc. So, uh, and the military was doing research with that. So then the American army thought, well, we got to do something also. They're probably doing something with the mental power. We've got to counter that with our thing. <laughs> so they hired uh, Hal Putoff, PhD, of the Stanford Research Institute to investigate what is this psychic power thing? What is it? Please do uh, give us a report on this. And he gave, he gave him money and whatever like that. And he selected one, Ingo Swan here, who was a, a natural psychic in America. Uh, and he started doing experiments to see if the powers of Ingo Swan were false or true, whether he was, you know, it's like, uh, what is that, uh, David Copperfield, is it? He does tricks and stuff like that. So we know there are tricks. Yeah? And uh, many magicians have so many different tricks they can do what it looks like, or I guess real. Uh, so is it was a trick like that that his powers were, or was it actual he could do things with his mind? So we had to devise experiments to see if it was real or trick like that. He did many types of experiments and then he found out that it was true. He could do many things with his mind that we cannot do. Yeah? So he says here, despite the ambiguities inherent in the type of exploration covered in these programs, the integrated results uh, appear to provide unequivocal evidence of a human capacity to access events remote in space and time, however falteringly by some cognitive process not yet understood. Which means that Ingo Swan could perceive things very far away, thousands of miles or millions of miles away, in the past or in the future even, or in the present by some means that we don't know. In other words, he could do it. He could get information, past, present, future, anywhere kind of thing. And not perfect, but they've got an experiment, this is maybe 80% correct information he could get. So that was his conclusion, that it existed, that power. My years of involvement as a research manager in these programs have left me with the conviction that this fact must be taken into account of any attempt to develop an unbiased picture of the structure of reality. So he had some powers 
which were coming from a different source. Of course, we know it's got to do with the mind. So that means the mind actually is real. It's doing things, but we don't understand how it works. It doesn't work according to res uh, normal physical laws. Yeah? It requires a, a, um, an object to go at a certain speed through space. It can jump over space, it can jump over time. The mind can also do that. How it does it, we don't know. Yeah? Of course, we know from Vedic literature, mind is an element. But it's quite unlike these elements. But here in modern uh, you know, physics, of course, they don't accept mind at the moment. But he's saying right, we should accept it. <laughs> because it's doing things. This is one experiment. Uh, he was given an envelope. And inside the envelope was a number, a long number, maybe a, a, a 20 digit number. That's it. Now that number did refer to some information, but they didn't tell him what that information was or the location or whatever it was. So actually it did indicate a location in Siberia, in the middle of Russia, which nobody knew about except the Russians and an American spy satellite that went over there and took photographs. <laughs> so they, they knew, but the public didn't know. Ingo Swan didn't know what it was. Something was happening in Siberia. That camera took the photographs. Nobody else knew about it. So they said, okay, what is it? They didn't tell him it was a photograph. They didn't tell him it was Siberia. They didn't tell him anything about it. Just give him a number. So he went into a little meditation. And then he drew these pictures. One was a map of the place with the roads and the buildings. The other was a machine on some little wheels there, four sets of wheels, and it was, you know, something that goes like this, like a, a big trolley or something like that. And then we have the third one there, the, uh, a 3D thing. So it was actually a, it looks like it's a, a big, huge industrial thing to carry a big object on the tracks. So that's what he drew. And this was actually true. The photograph that the uh, spy satellite took was an installation in Russia, uh, a secret installation of uh, a place where they were building a new submarine, some nuclear submarine. And uh, the map that he drew matched the map that was drawn, that was photographed by the spy satellite. And we see the object here is exactly what he drew here, a little bit different, but very, very similar. So in other words, he could do many experiments like this in which he, he had no way of knowing what the object was, but he could identify the object that they were hinting at. Yeah? Very, very powerful. Other people have done... Um, so that shows the mind is very, very powerful. And what the yogis have done, or what we hear about the yogis, you know, going here and there with the mind, Yingo Swan could do that. And it was not false, according to... Halputov, the scientist who was investigating this. Um, apart from that, we have other people. Professor Robert John of Princeton University, he did experiments with to see if people had the power to move objects with their mind. There was one famous woman in Russia that could do that. She could move objects across the table with her mind. <laughs> So they wanted to know if human beings could do that, so they, he devised his experiment. Here we see those black balls. And so the, you press a button and a black ball will fall down and it can go left or right. And it's an equal, it's a very level surface. So you press it a hundred times, you should go half one way, half the other way. You cannot force, you know, you can't tilt the thing at all. Just press, press, press. Now the only factor that could influence it is if you think, well, let the ball go to the left, let the ball go to the left, let the ball go to the left, or let the ball go to the right, let the ball go to the right. And then you could see, after you do a few thousand times, whether the ball actually went a little bit more to the left, let it go to the left, so we get maybe 545 going to the left and the less going to the right. Let it go to the left. <laughs> and they found that it worked. <laughs> they could get the people to make a few more balls go in the right direction. <laughs> and it wasn't a powerful effect, but at least they could get it consistently. 
They also tried the experiment in um, separating the people over like from London to New York. So the person in London would think, let the ball go to the right, let the ball go to the right. And it actually had an influence in New York, over 3,000 miles. Wow, far out. <laughs> they did another experiment in London and New York, and he thought about it a week beforehand. So there was separation of time. They did the experiment one week later in New York. Still, the same influence was there. So in other words, the mind could operate over time and over space. 3,000 miles of space and one week in time. The influence of the mind could influence, could make the objects in New York work like this. Oh, far out. All forces known to physics, like gravity for example, diminish with distance and no forces in physics operate freely across time like this. It's as if consciousness is somehow able to direct its influence directly across space and time. An understanding that certainly poses a challenge for science. Huh? And then another experiment said, this is similar to what mystics have claimed through the ages, but we now have scientific evidence. So the mind is very powerful. It can influence objects. Some did research in China. There's a, a, a German uh, person there, this Duer, Theoretical Physics Institute in Germany. Uh, so um, he was in um, investigating um, Qigong, which is like yoga in China. Uh, and there's one uh, you know, person had quite a great powers there. Huh? Uh, so uh, he was trying to prove if they, that Qigong power or the mind was, could was actually existing and could it really do things physically to molecules or atoms or whatever like that. Huh? And his idea, of course, was to use it for science, uh, for, for medicine to help cure people like that. So, uh, and one uh, research was this. This is a little technical. Uh, so, we got hydrogen and carbon monoxide. We can combine it and we can get carbon dioxide. But that takes a lot of energy. Uh, uh, it requires 30 atmospheres pressure, 300 degrees Celsius heat to do that. If you want to do it in a test tube or whatever. You can't do it in a test tube, but you have to do it maybe in a, in a metal container. Okay? So, uh, they did the experiment with this uh, Zan uh, Yanzing, <laughs> so she's meditating across the room uh, at, at the compounds and trying to combine them with his mind. First experiment, the whole thing exploded, it broke because they used glass containers, it wouldn't work. So they put everything in a steel container and sealed it up, and then he meditated. And he got it. He made, he made carbon dioxide with his mind. <laughs> but you would have to actually heat it up to 300 degrees Celsius and put 30 degrees pressure on it if you wanted to do it physically. He did it with his mind. Somehow his chi, or his key, was able to do it. <laughs> Again, mysterious. <laughs> Another one, I don't know if this is actually true, but it's legendary. <laughs> Zhang Baosheng, he was a very powerful uh, Qigong person. And uh, they, they hired about 30 uh, scientists in China to investigate this person, uh, defense ministry actually. Uh, so, in one experiment and w with even foreign dignitaries witnessing it, he was able to take a 45 kg sack of sugar and move it through a wall with his mind. So matter would pass through matter using his mind. Huh. Far out. <laughs> Another experiment was the bug experiment. <laughs> they put a bug into a glass container and then from a distance he would meditate on the bug and he got the bug out of the jar, alive, without breaking the jar. How did he do it? Uh, so they were wondering, well maybe he, he dissembled it? And put it outside the jar and reassemble the whole thing again with his mind. Or did he pull it out of the jar through the glass? What did he actually do? I couldn't figure it out.
So they did a, um, they got a real fast Nikon camera that goes something like 200 frames per second. Normal, you know, movie camera goes 16 frames per second, I think. Like this. So this was a very quick camera. Uh, 200 frames per second or something like that. So then they did the experiment again and he got the bug out and then they looked at all the frames and I think on three frames they could see the bug passing through the glass. <laughs> With his mind he was able to do that. Pass matter through matter, even live matter through the glass. Mm. Far out, how can the mind do that? So therefore the mind is very very powerful. Uh, which is why the yogis <laughs> concentrate on trying to control the mind. And in the process of controlling the mind, they get cities such as ability to read other people's minds, ability to travel here and there at will, and go places, get information, come back, etc. Just like Ingo Swan can do. Uh, so, very, very powerful. But we have to train the mind. Actually, uh, the next step in, in um, Hal Puthoff's research was, uh, can we get our soldiers to do this so we can spy on the Russians? <laughs> we can go, we don't need a spy satellite, we can just send her, you know, go by the mine, pick up information from Moscow or wherever and come back with the information. So, uh, train our soldiers up to do that. So they actually did discover a means of doing that which required meditation techniques. So you had to relax the mind, etc. And then they, they developed a whole protocol for uh, being able to uh, recall, um, direct the mind somewhere, get information and come back. Interesting program. It's called remote viewing, which later on some of the people in the military came out and they teach that publicly now to people, that you can learn how to do this with your mind, go out and get information, come back, etc. Yeah. Uh, they have programs for that. Uh, so, uh, that's the power of the mind. And if you can practice, you can do it. Which means that human beings have that power to do some remarkable things. Now these people are quite remarkable, like in China and Ingo Swan, but even the normal soldier, <laughs> American soldier, could get trained up and do this also to some degree. Which means everybody has this potential in the mind to do things, but we're not utilizing it. We don't know how to utilize the mind properly. Uh, so, in Bhagavad Gita, of course, even in the second chapter, Krishna emphasizes this, the mind is very powerful. Uh, one must deliver himself with the help of his mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. So, of course, this is the mystical level and like uh, moving objects with your mind or traveling at the speed of light or whatever, but it's a, a more spiritual level. Uh, what can the mind do? It can degrade you in the material world. It can elevate you in the material world. You can take you to upper planets. It can take you beyond the material world. It can get you liberation. It can take you to Goloka. Or it can drag you to hell. So the mind very powerful to do that. And we see the mind is very powerful with many things that the yogis can do, so uh, this is not an exaggerated statement. Mind is very important. And of course, we know that, uh, as chapter 8 says, whatever state of being one remembers when he quits his present body in his next life, he will attain that state without fail. So the mind produces your next body. It can create matter for you, <laughs> simply by the mind. Well, very, very powerful. As we see, I explained already this whole thing with the uh, dying and then because of the death wounds carried over in the mind, the imprint of the next body of the person. Yeah. Well, that is the power of a mind over matter. <laughs> ah. So, mind is very powerful, but then mind is also a source of our limitation. Why? Because the mind is full of desires and karma. Hmm? Uh, we got all these circumstances that are forced on us by previous activities hmm? held in the mind and then we keep on having desires which pull us this way and that way. 
So Bhagavad Gita says, as a strong wind sweeps away a boat on the water, even one of the roaming senses in which the mind focuses can carry away a man's intelligence. So the mind is very powerful, but the senses drag the mind here and there, even beyond our will. So very, very difficult. Eh? Nevertheless, when Arjuna says, ah, it's very difficult to do all of this. Eh? So then what is Krishna's reply? It is undoubtedly very difficult to curb the restless mind, but it is possible by suitable practice and by detachment. So if you train the mind, you can utilize the power of the mind. You don't train the mind, you're wasting your mind, basically, and wasting your human life. <laughs> That's the message of Krishna. So it is possible. And as I said, if you want, you can try to get mystic powers and be like the yogis and whatever, uh, if you do yoga, or if you want to be like uh, in military and train up your mind with remote viewing, you can do that also, and you can you know, <laughs> uh, send your mind out and get information, and you can do that. Or you can use the mind in another way to get beyond the whole material world, beyond birth and death. So mind, very, very powerful. Uh, so in the Bhagavad Gita, of course, Krishna gives the hierarchy of who's in control. The working senses are superior to dull, mat dull matter. Mind is higher than the senses. Intelligence is higher than the mind. And soul is higher than the intelligence. So soul's actually at the top. But in the present time, it's not at the top. It's not got all of the power. The power is down in the bottom. <laughs> Sense objects mind and dragging the mind this way. Even though, technically, the intelligence is higher than the mind and the Atma is higher than the intelligence. So, we've got a problem here in the material world. Huh? They were getting pulled by the senses in the opposite direction. Yeah. Hmm. So, as I said, the, uh, the mind is kind of in the middle here <laughs> and it gets pulled huh, by the senses into the material world and we forget about the soul completely. So, how to get out of that position? So, in chapter 2, a very simple solution is given, a little hint here. The embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, though a taste for sense objects remains. So, just by blocking the senses, it doesn't really work because you keep thinking of those sense objects and things in the material world. But ceasing such engagements by experiencing a higher taste, he is fixed in consciousness. So, if we can get a higher taste, we can give up the lower taste. Yeah? So our taste at the moment is for material enjoyment. If we get a higher taste, something higher, which means ultimately Atma, <laughs> then we can give up the lower taste. Yeah? So the whole process of spiritual life is to get that higher taste, spiritual taste. When we do that and we can fix in that, then it's easy to uh, control the senses and take them away from matter and, and direct them in the right way. Yeah. Higher taste. Yeah. <coughs> okay, well, we've got a lot to go here. Hmm. I wonder if I should continue here and do this tomorrow. Any questions there so far? Uh. Uh, do you think that by the power, power of the mind, like people can visit the spiritual war and uh, well, yeah, well, this is what bhakti yoga is. <laughs> we control the mind. Ultimately, once we control the mind, we develop, we can activate the atma. If we activate, activate the atma with bhakti, this will connect us to the spiritual world. And we can go to the spiritual world. Yeah. So it's not just the mind, ultimately. Uh, the process of bhakti means actually we get the mercy of Krishna, <laughs> so we get the power of Krishna to direct us to the spiritual world. But we have to have the right uh, devotion eh? and the right qualification. Eh? But the mind is very necessary to do that also. We have to concentrate the mind in the right direction, not get uh, sidetracked into the material world. We can use the mind, but ultimately we can't get, take the mind to the spiritual world. This mind is material. 
So you can't take the mind or the material body to the spiritual world. Instead you develop a spiritual mind. <laughs> uh, a spiritual body, a spiritual mind. And then that goes to the spiritual world. Uh, but as I said, the, like the yogi is using the mind to get free of matter. Uh, he concentrates the mind, withdraws from the sense objects. So, same in uh, bhakti, but our process is not just withdrawing from matter and doing this pratyahara, uh, withdrawing our senses from matter and concentrating like this. We direct our senses towards Krishna, direct the mind towards Krishna. Then they all become spiritualized. And eventually, we develop spiritual mind, spiritual senses. Sorry, Raja mentioned um, it's not a matter of just. Um, trying to block the mind from the senses, but we need to get that higher taste. Yeah. Of course, yes, there's yes. a period from, like, uh, the study path from beginning until the higher taste. Yeah. There's yeah. a big gap in between, so if yeah. you're not actually experiencing that higher taste, it seems there still needs to be some sort of practice of detachment or blocking. Otherwise, what, what other system is there? Mm, yeah, so uh, what we have is that the first taste is called faith. <laughs> Got a little bit of, little bit of inclination. Okay, I'll, I'll at least accept this. It looks like it's true. <laughs> Scripture is true. I'll accept the Bhagavad Gita. That's the faith we start with. Then we read it, and then our next faith is we'll follow it. We'll try to follow this process. Krishna says Bhakti Yoga is the best process, so I'll try to follow this process. What is Bhakti Yoga? Okay, I offer things to the Lord, leaf fruit, a flower to the Lord, etc. So we try that. So that, and then of course what happens is that as you do Bhakti, the Atma develops attraction for the Lord. So that's your first taste. Huh? That increases, increases, increases until we come to Bhava when you actually experience the Lord. Then the taste is so much there that matter is useless. Uh, so the, we're gradually increasing. Uh, so as we begin the process of bhakti, we do have to also control the senses. So that's why uh, we do have some minimum levels of rules and regulations we have to follow in order to practice bhakti. Otherwise, if we don't, it becomes very unsteady. So there is some minimum sense control necessary also. But even if you don't have that level, you could still start the process, but it's, let's say, more unsteady. <laughs> So everybody can do bhakti, but if we want to be serious, then we do have to follow some minimum standard of control of the senses, which we have like four regulated principles. Don't have any problem with controlling the mind, at least externally, you know, they become very fixed for other people can spend their whole life struggling with a particular anatta or issue with the mind. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah. so is it just um, one is more advanced than the other or a particular karmic situation where the minds are different? How would we understand? Well, I guess we can say like this that some jivas have more attachment to the material world either negatively or positively or whatever they're searching for enjoyment or they're filled with frustration or fear or whatever so they got a lot of anartas mixed up with them so very very difficult for them to advance but if they get faith somehow or other even in that situation they can overcome it uh, it's possible like uh, Ajamil got rid of all of his karmas <laughs> instantaneously by chanting the name of Narayan is possible, but in many cases, of course, we see that people, they really have to struggle, struggle, and struggle, probably because of previous upper odds. So that delays the process a lot. Yeah? So uh, therefore, uh, people who are in that struggling position will have much more problem. But we can say generally it's probably because of previous upper odds. Uh, so it takes them longer to, uh, you know, get steady. Could we say that um, in that struggle, Krishna is appreciating the, uh, the struggle? Oh, definitely. Country? Yeah, definitely. Well, even if you chant accidentally, he appreciates that, as he did with Ajamil. <laughs> the Yamaduda, the Vishnudas come and they say, oh, you can't touch him. And we say, why? He's all doing sinful activity. Well, anyway, our master said, anyone who chants the name, fine. <laughs> so, you know, you got privilege just by associating accidentally with bhakti, which is speak of doing it purposely. So even that is mercy of the Lord. Uh, but the effect may be very little, or uh, weaker, on, on many people because of the, so many offenses and coverings on their, on the jiva at the moment. Yeah. Analogy of uh, 
two people give $10 to Krishna, one's a rich man, one's a poor man. So yeah. Krishna's going to appreciate the, the struggle of the poor man. Yeah, yeah, poor, yeah, so yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I feel like uh, as bhaktas we sometimes get um, maybe like, deterred from practicing Ashtanga Yoga, um, but mm-hmm. it seems like it's um, potentially can provide some strength to our bhakti practice. Mm-hmm. For example, like obviously intensive chanting is something that, that I struggle with and a lot of people struggle with, but mm-hmm. if we're practicing the microphone, if we're practicing the um, breath work, um, asanas and meditation and that would lead to more attentive chanting and allow us to engage more in our bhakti practice as well. So it's mm-hmm. not yoga would be supportive towards bhakti. It can be used, um, yoga can be used, but we have to be a little careful of it, just like everything else. Karma yoga is there, jnana is also there, and it's not that we ban it completely, so the definition of bhakti is uh, karma, jnana, and avratam, it should not be obstacle. The, these processes should not be an obstacle to bhakti, which means we should not get attached to the material goals of karma yoga or to liberation of jnana or to siddhis of yoga process or even liberation in the yoga process also. If we're using it for uh, steadying the mind or whatever is a secondary process, yes, then we can do that. Uh, I've read some of the, um, the Patanjali sutras, that, that book, Mm-hmm. I think he actually refers to, because he spoke about one of the stages of the eight limbs of yoga, about focusing the mind on an object. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he says that you can focus on chakra. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it seems like there's a, there's a nice point there. Yeah, he also has said uh, in the uh, Niyamas there is worship of the Lord. Um, Ishvara Pranidhan is one of the, in the second limb of uh, thing, <laughs> worship of the Lord. <laughs> But of course, uh, many critics, uh, devotional critics, as well, it's not really bhakti because ultimately, you know, the idea is impersonal Brahman or Atma realization. But nevertheless, he does recognize the Lord to some degree. <laughs> and when you said about being distracted from these practices, I think Gaurabhinda Swami has a quote where he says, mm-hmm. Pranayama is the gateway to hell. <laughs> I assume you meant that if you focus on that, you get attached to the bodily concept as a result of just the okay. yeah. work yeah. and perhaps that will result in yeah. that yeah. 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 Or, even like he says, the cities, as directly mentioned, don't become attached to those cities, because then you, then you can't realize Atma. <laughs> so it also becomes a problem that people, they get it into the cities, oh, I'm traveling out of my body, I'm going here and there, and then they forget about realizing Atma because of that. So one can be distracted in the process itself or too attached to the process for itself rather than to bhakti. So that's the danger. So in other words, it can be a positive thing as long as we keep the end goal in mind. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Amara. Thank you, uh, I was thinking about observation. We see so many professional sportsmen they are confronting their senses, they are confronting their mind, they are able to do things which me and you or other people cannot do. Yeah. Like racing a Formula One car 350 when you speed in, in a truck, when you're sitting on the floor, you cannot see the truck unless you have concentration, you understand in your mind. Or any sport uh, which people dedicate their life, they also have sense control because these people, they cannot just perform or concentrate if they have control senses, mm. the strict diet, exercise, they wake up a certain hour, they're really focusing their mind into what they're doing. It looks like, it, of course, it's very difficult to control the mind and senses, but there are people doing this, only that their goal is going to be different. So? It was, <laughs> why, why, uh, I mean, how can these people progress in spiritual oh, life? Well, so yeah, mind yeah, and yeah. This is kind of in the next pro- the next thing here is using the mind in practical ways. So we can use it materially uh, to concentrate on goals and achieve goals, and that's exactly what the sportsmen do. They realize that if they really want to win the, the big prize, you know, the international whatever it is. 
then they really have to discipline themselves, they really have to concentrate on the goal, and to do that, then they have to sacrifice this, sacrifice that, they have to practice enough, they concentrate the mind, they have to give up so many things to you know, actually get that goal. Uh, so they're actually utilizing this principle of the mind uh, to do that. It's a material goal, of course. But if they take it a little bigger, then they understand that uh, actually this whole practice, there's some other factor there that at a certain stage, there's this, uh, you let go. And it's just mercy of the Lord suddenly. <laughs> so some of them realize that. And then they realize, oh yeah, there's a, there's a higher power acting here also. Uh, so there's a, a certain stage where they realize that in some athletes or whatever. Uh, so then that's the beneficial aspect of that. Uh, and of course, if, 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 to begin with, if they're already spiritual and they're doing this, then they could take advantage of this uh, whole process to actually advance spiritually because they can control the mind so they can use that for spiritual practice as well. Well, I guess it's like Gopu Kumar. He was able to go up and down in the universe all over the place. <laughs> That's better than the mystic yogis. They, they even couldn't do that. Uh, there's an example in Lord Chaitanya's past on. Who was the one that would... Did he ride around on a broomstick or something? <laughs> all sorts of things. So, so you, you could manifest powers, but they don't want to do that because it's a distraction from their bhakti, actually. But possible. Everything is possible for the devotee. Uh, of course, he can also go to higher planets. That's the karma. You know, he can get liberation. Um, what is it? Prabodha Nanda what he says that uh, mm, moksha and uh, mukti and mukti are like two little servants following after the devotee. He says, please let me engage me in, <laughs> engage me in your service. I really want to serve you. But then the devotee's thinking, I don't want you know, material things because it's going to distract me. I don't want svargaloka. I don't want liberation. <laughs> So they kick away these <laughs> bhakti and mukti because they're distractions for bhakti. This is a question that Charles Prabhu had about uh, the Vedic Sutra and the Yeah, that's Shamananda. Mm -hmm. So he traveled in, in the spiritual body to the spiritual world. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when we're in the material world and you have prema, then you simultaneously have a spiritual body and a material body. And uh, then uh, when you go into trance or whatever, then you go into your spiritual body and you can see Krishna, go to Krishna or whatever like that and then come back to your material body again. And sometimes there's an interaction between the two bodies or whatever even so. <laughs> but the, generally, as long as you do have the material body, it's also a limitation of sorts because you, you're not completely free as just having a spiritual body. Okay. Okay, Hare Krishna.